is the name of the famous videotape that our viewers are about to see? Okay, that's sometimes referred to as the Patterson Gimlin film. The Patterson film. And I would like ask uh, staff there to please roll this, and if you would narrate for our viewers and tell us what are we about to see? What is this video? There's an animal walking through the forest. This is slightly advanced speed. It was what really forest? Where? In north northwestern California, Bluff Creek. Claimant who gets seems to get the most attention uh, on this point is is Bob Hieronymus, who claimed to be the man in the fur suit. The problem with this, uh, the most uh, glaring problem, is as as he uh, joined forces with Philip Morris, a famous costume designer, the two apparently didn't uh, confer sufficiently before sharing their stories because they didn't get them straight. They they, they contradict. Bob Hieronymus gave a description of the costume that was diametrically opposed to the description of the costume provided by Philip Morris. Uh, Hieronymus describes a costume that was made out of a green horse hide and talked about it being in uh, two principal pieces, one that came over the top, you know, like, like pajama tops, but without any buttons or enclosures, just a piece that was probably stitched up the back and a pair of, of stiff trousers that he, he wore, of course, and he had football pads, he claimed, and other padding to bulk him out a bit. And then a football helmet that had a fake face built out around it with a single eye opening because Bob has uh, one glass eye and he, they used his spare glass eye in the face of the costume in order to catch the glint of the of the sun, he claimed. Now imagine walking in this unwieldy costume with a, a single port of vision, which he claims was a good two inches away from his eye. So put a little toilet paper roll up against your eye and then go out there, close the other, and try to walk on an uneven, uh, irregular surface. But if that wasn't enough, then Philip Morris claimed that, that Roger had simply purchased an then modified one of his off-the-shelf costumes. So to counter some of this misinformation that's being continually perpetuated and just accepted to the point that it's becoming cliche almost in some people's minds, and, and to, uh, to counter some other assertions that have been made, even a few that were made here tonight in a respectful, collegial, professional way, I'm going to review some of the the insights that we've gained about the Patterson Gilman film. And I say with you because this isn't just my evaluation, these are the opinions that have been ar uh, arrived at by a number of, of varied researchers, and I'll draw upon their expertise as well as my own uh, findings and observations. This is mostly, I'm not going to address the issues of the timeline or the context of the film. I'll make a couple of comments about some other things that have been said just to offer you another point of view tonight, but uh, I'm mostly going to focus on the film subject itself and just look at it from the ground up. So starting with the footprints, for a long time people criticized that there were no, uh, there, there was no direct evidence that the footprints documented at the Bluff Creek film site were actually laid down by the film subject and leave open the allegation or the insinuation rather that the footprints could have been fabricated separately or, or uh, uh, masterminded in some other way to avoid the very obvious challenges of creating footprints that would sink an inch, an inch and a half into this, uh, this uh, sandy substrate uh, by an actor wearing oversized artificial, uh, otherwise inflexible feet. Well, there was this, quote, second roll of film. Roger had been shooting panoramic shots, scenery uh, shots, throughout uh, the trip. And as it happened, at the moment that they encountered the Sasquatch, he had just a very little bit of film left on the roll, thankfully, had just enough, it seemed. And then after running that film out, he quickly uh, went under a poncho. A poncho he had to actually change out the film by hand and, and uh, in, in as much dark as he could create to avoid exposing the film. And then the second roll of film was loaded into the camera 
which he then used to film some of the footprints, including a, a couple that he uh, cast, one of which is seen here. Uh, Yvonne Leclerc has taken some of the shots, the individual shots from that, that piece of film, and then laced them together to create something of a panorama. Now, there's the potential for a little bit of distortion. As you can imagine, these are not, uh, these are shots that were taken walking along above the, the, the footprints. But nevertheless, it, it shows a very clear uh, indication of, of the footprints at the film site, uh, where, and, and shows, in fact, uh, can mention here some with some interesting details, including uh, a pressure release ridge or disc that's evident uh, very plainly here. They're actually a very good example of that. Uh, M.K. Davis has uh, uh, did some good work early on in which he identified some features through some you know, scrutiny of the film. And one is depicted in this little clip that was shown on National Geographic. And you can see right there, uh, he showed that in that wildly gyrating early segment of the film, there actually were some frames that showed the footprints going up that steep uh, edge of the sandbar. The sandbar itself stood about 34, 36 inches above the creek itself. So it was quite a substantial bed of sand. And uh, uh, apparently the, the film subject had crossed the creek ahead of Roger and Bob and then walked up, stepped up in a couple of steps up the side of that steep embankment that Roger actually ran into when he ran across the creek and, and dropped him, which dropped him to his knees. And that's where the film stabilizes the footprints. And so, as I said, the, the footprints do take on a very um, uh, a tremendous amount of significance. And to emphasize that significance, when, when I undertook to name the footprints, to give them a name based on uh, the conventions of hypnotaxonomy, it's a, a system of nomenclature devised in order to allow paleontologists to name uh, fossilized footprints for which the skeletons of those track makers were not yet recognized or known. So they could talk about them in an intelligent way with a, with a, a formalized label or handle. Applying that to the Sasquatch tracks, tracks that exist for which we don't know the track maker, per se, it was not recognized formally, uh, this is the name that, uh, that I arrived at, Anthropoidopes ameriborealis, which just simply means North American eight foot. And the type specimens are the right and left that are, um, were cast by Roger at the site and uh, attributed or then uh, referred to that material or the, the ten tracks that were cast by Bob Titmus. Uh, molds and replicas of those calves are housed at the Smithsonian and then the original, the original ten titmus casts are housed in the Willow Creek Museum. So we've met that criteria. There be uh, specimens, the type specimens, or at least facsimiles of the type specimens be housed at an accredited uh, uh, institution. And this article passed muster with five peer reviewers from the discipline of hypnotaxonomy. From these are paleontologists who whose specialty is the interpretation, the analysis, and description of fossil footprints of various types, from dinosaurs through, through mammals, uh, uh, Mesozoic and through Pleistocene mammals, <clears throat> received very positively. So it was a huge step forward in recognition by this, this arena, published in the bulletin of the New Mexico Museum of Natural History, the symposium volume on Senzo tracks and traces. So anytime anyone has a question about the state of the art of Cenozoic tracks, they'll refer to this reference, and in thumbing through it, bingo, they'll get a paper about Sasquatch tracks as well, another Cenozoic mammal. So it's really, really quite, uh, quite good. All right, uh, I talked a lot about the metatarsal brain last time. Is there anybody here that wasn't here last time? A few of you were, okay. Well, quickly, the prehensile uh, versus propulsive division of the foot uh, marks the adaptation of, of great apes, which, which are characterized by grass climbing adaptation. They hold the substrate with the fourth part of the foot, the calcaneus acts as the lever, and so there's some degree of decoupling there between those two. 
This is where that joint is. It's not an extra joint or a different joint. It's just, it's just the joint has a greater range of motion in the apes versus the humans. It's actually a compound joint between four bones, two pairs of bones, the talus and the navicular. So right there's half of it, and there's the calcaneus and the cuboid. Here it is in the chimp right across there. Now you can see right off the bat, hopefully, uh, the extension of this surface right here along the ankle bone, the talus, T-A. That indicates a, range, a much greater range of motion where the navicular can ride clear up onto that, that surface, that of the joint. In humans, it's much more restricted. So you can imagine if this bone is riding upward, that means that the foot is bending in that direction or twisting in that direction. All right. So, as I mentioned before, it's, it is now becoming accepted, <clears throat> finally, I've been saying this for, along with a couple other voices, for about 10 years now, that the earliest human, or human ancestors that were bipedal, exhibited, in fact, evidence of a transverse tarsal joint that had a much greater range of motion than found in modern humans. And that even though they were walking on two legs, even though they had a greatly reduced degree of divergence of their big toe, these early hominids walked on flat, flexible feet. And they did it for millions of years. If the evolution of bipedalism originated as early as seven million years, this species alone uh, was practicing it for four and a half million years. And, and we're doing just fine at it. So the, the uh, objection that there's no precedent for my description of the Sasquatch foot walking on a flat, flexible foot doesn't, doesn't have any footing, so to speak. <laughs> so here's just another piece of evidence. I had pointed out repeatedly that in the published photographs of some of these tracks, there was this unusual ridge right here. And they said, uh, you know, the, the people who were from the site, who had excavated it themselves, said, oh, well, it's just a, a termite burrow. These subterranean termites are burrowing through the ash, and they just went through the track. I says, well, yes, we have a line of alternating tracks running north and south, and these burrows then all are running east and west, and they independently happen to intersect about a half dozen of the tracks at precisely the same point along the track's length. So that seems a little odd, doesn't it? Well, you know, yeah, but it's, well, maybe it's just excavation artifact. Um, there was someone recently who, who commented that, that Tim White, when asked about this, would, uh, would simply say that uh, it was uh, Mary Leakey with uh, going crazy with her hammer and chisel and, and exfoliating a, a layer of the ash. I'm losing my, my, my life here. And uh, creating a little ridge there. Well, I went down and I visited with Tim White, and he had in his possession, amongst uh, other photographs and, and, and uh, uh, materials related to the footprints, a, a series of uh, uh, several molds, uh, or casts rather, of the footprint. And this one was the, this one was the uh, million dollar uh, mold right here. Because right here is an extrusion front. It's, the, it's just the rounded lip. This is not, there's no chance this is from fracturing, fractured strata from poor excavation technique. This is, uh, this is the contact surface. This is an extrusion where the wet, gloppy ash pressed out from under the fore part of the foot. Its, its edge, its uh, leading edge, is identical to several examples where the ash squoze up between the first and second toes and then dropped over under its own weight and has the same kind of rounded contour and surface. Now, I've used the yellow lines here to simply indicate the, the points of, uh, of uh, correlation here between the deepest point of the heel and between the deepest point of the big toe. Uh, so you can see that this is just, up above is just, uh, up above here is just extraneous, uh, the glop of ash, the plot there. But the uh, agreement in the position of that, of that joint is, is really good. Anyway, but the short of it is simply this. It's now very evident, and it's becoming more and more accepted, that early hominids uh, were walking with flat, flexible feet. I showed this at the American, or the American Association of Physical Anthropology meetings and uh, uh, turned a number of heads with this. It's basically a negative, and, and if you stare at it, 
or not, it, it may bounce back and forth uh, to negative and positive. It, I'm sorry, it's a positive, it's a scan of that one of the Leotola tracks that has been turned into a positive so that it's sticking out at you. So it gives you a little more sense of what the shape of the foot was like that filled that track. Now, there's clearly some slide in and so forth, but you can see the deepest point of the heel. So it has this very tapered heel. And but the, the, the important point is this feature right here, right here, and that can be seen as the deepest point right here. This foot is flexed at the, across the midfoot. Now, not up with the creating a pressure ridge, but it's flexed in the other direction, which is just the reciprocal of the same range of motion that that joint can show in an ape-like foot. It's not an arch because it goes all the way across. There is no lateral column edge of the foot sinking in differentially deeper. Okay. Now, what really has kind of turned the corner on this, this whole discussion, has been the discovery <coughs> of the uh, Hobbit, Homo floresiensis, and here, now, here's one of the disinformations that I want to counter. Uh, Dr. David Daylin, a, a former colleague of mine, a former fellow student uh, of, of, uh, of mine, and, and for some reason there's some rumor that we were roommates in college, and that's not true. We were lab mates, I mean classmates rather, in college, uh, he was in the doctoral program in anthropological sciences, and I was in the doctoral program in anatomical sciences across the way. We had many courses together. We graduated within about a year of one another. I was looking at feet. He was looking at jaws, looking at the jaw mechanics of, of uh, primates. But he's taken an interest in uh, Sasquatch as an exercise in critical thinking and objectivity and anti-pseudoscience, etc., etc. And in his book, he publishes this picture. He took exception to my interpretation of the mid-tarsal break and the pressure ridge evident in the Sasquatch footprints. And said, oh, any human footprint will show that. If you just walk barefoot in the sand, here you go. Here's your pressure ridge. Well, he needs to stick with the jaws. He doesn't know feet. And this simply just isn't equivalent. Um, and I don't think I show, no, go back one, we, we, we back one form, just push the arrow button. Uh, you can see that this is a pressure release disc, but where does it begin? Not back here behind the transverse tarsal joint, but right here is where it starts. Here's where the material is pumping up, pumping up, and it's, you can see the break here creating the disc that displaces the sand back this way. But the point of the pressure release is focused right here at the ball of the foot. Okay, the leading edge of the arch. Totally different than the mid tarsal break. There's just no comparison. And the fact that that point is lost on him indicates that he doesn't understand the biomechanics of the foot uh, in, a, in the great apes and humans, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. Matt Crowley kind of took me to task and, and on the web has published a whole string of, uh, of essays and so forth. And he went and made some of these uh, rubber foot contrivances and went out in the sand and said, well, look, I can make a mid-tarsal pressure ridge too. See, here it is. Well, there's a whole series of discs here, but again, and the pressure ridge is starting way up here, much further forward. And if you look, he, he shows several pictures, so let's look at another one. Here's another one. Oh, look, here's a pressure ridge. So this looks like Dr. Melbourne's pressure ridge. But what happens if you put them side by side? They're in completely different places. They don't indicate the uh, articulation of a joint because obviously they're just rubber feet. Uh, because, and the placement of the disc is inconsistent from step to step, uh, which is not the case with the Sasquatch tracks. From independent cases, I've demonstrated pressure ridges that are in the appropriate position proportionately along the length of the foot to indicate that there is a skeletal, a rigid skeletal uh, anatomy underlying the soft tissue that is responsible for this. So again, stick to what you're good at, you know. Don't, uh, and you can see this in, uh, in, in this series, for example, you can see the heels start to show up here. Now again, there's the caveat that there's a little bit of topography right here that's obscuring 
some of the foot. But let's be real. You can see that the foot would be flat right about here. We can see part of the heel. Here, that portion of the heel is vertical, absolutely 90 degrees perpendicular vertical to the ground. If the foot wasn't bent at the midfoot, the toes would be sticking in the ground about 10 inches down here. But they're not. They're folded right underneath here. So this is, without any question, an example of mid-tarsal brain. Okay, and then of course there's other examples I've showed shown um, this from the tracks that I examined in 1996 outside of Walla Walla, Washington, the half tracks. Okay, you can quibble all you want if you want to hold on to those tired arguments, those indefensible arguments, but then how do you deal with the half tracks? How do you deal with a footprint that has no heel imprint whatsoever, that looks like this in the reconstruction of what's going on? Or the Okay, here's that, uh, here's that skeletal reconstruction. Okay, then there's the herniation. We move on up. Doug drew attention to this. I had never really paid much attention to, to these details, but it was quite amazing. This is the before and after, just as those of the muscles of the quadriceps on the front of the thigh are flexing in order to begin to extend this, uh, the, the thigh on the knee this bulge appears right there, very prominently, and it just pops out, and then it disappears after a little bit, once the muscle relaxes. Now, this could be uh, the, the thigh beneath the skin and superficial fascia, or adipose, the fat, under the skin. There is a very thick connective tissue layer called the fascia lata, that is the connective tissue covering around the muscles. And in the lower extremities, it's very, very thin, kind of like a it's like support holes. It helps to create hydrostatic pressure that helps build the blood back up towards the heart against gravity. In the, as a result of a penetrating injury or as a result of some infectious diseases like tuberculosis, the fascia can break down and have openings or holes that the muscle actually pops through, pushes through when it contracts, creates this herniation, quadriceps herniation. You can flip to any orthopedic text and read about this. Uh, I was descri describing this one time to one of my uh, classes, my occupational physical therapy and anatomy classes, and this girl goes, oh, oh, I have that. I said, oh, she says, yeah, right here. She says, put your hand right here. So she took a step and, and right there, oh, ping pong ball sized protrusion pops up under my hand. And it disappeared when she relaxed her leg. And when she put her weight on it, boom, pops right through. You can see it just like a ping pong ball. So it's really quite amazing. Uh, the hand. Now, this is a funny story, and it's a very telling story. Uh, there's a history to it. Uh, many of the print images that you see of Patty are under the copyright of formerly Bernadette Hand and now his heirs, Eric and Martin. And the copy that uh, Renee provided for these had a blemish on the film, which was right there on frame 352. Right there and right there. And for many years, a lot of people erroneously kept thinking that this was the fingers making kind of an okay sign. Like the fingers have this big, these big long fingers wrapping around and beating the thumb. They're not fingers at all. It's just a photographic blemish. If you go back to the original, and uh, well, here's, here's the close-up of it. So people have been interpreting this as, as, uh, as fingers, and as a result, they think that Patty's kind of walking like an Egyptian, with the palm facing upward and backward. Okay? If you go to the, uh, well, at, and uh, you can hear myself, Bob Hieronymus, when you know, everyone kept saying he walked like Patty did, and that's why he was happy the man in the pursuit. When Bob would walk with this kind of funny walk of his, he would turn his hand way back so the palm's facing backward. Why would he do that? He doesn't walk that way naturally. You know, there, there are other film clips he's appeared on TV when he's walking to the bar, and he, he walks along just fine. But here, especially, he's exaggerating. He's turning his palm back. Well, why? If we go to the original, or not to the original, but this is, this is kind of an interesting story. This is a, a, a close-up of a five by seven color print that I bought from Roger Patterson when I was in fifth grade after I'd gone to the Spokane Coliseum. 
and I joined his Northwest Research Association and I purchased an 11 by 14 black and white print, 5 by 7 color print. And it's probably one of the clearest, crispest prints uh, of that film that's available. And so you zoom in and there's no spot there. All you can see is the back of the hand. Right here, you know, here's the, the wrist tapers right there, and then these are knuckles. Just like that. The hand, the fingers are curled in, the back of the hand is facing you as the arm swings. Not the palm side. You can't see anything of the, of the fingers even on that hand whatsoever. But Bob doesn't know that. He's looking at the films he keeps seeing on TV or the, or the um, stills that he keeps seeing in magazines. And so what does he do? He exaggerates by turning his hand and swinging it back and forth like an Egyptian. All right. How about the face? Well, there's been lots of different artistic renderings, and apparently there's this one frame that keeps circulating that gives the face this very Neanderthal look. That frame can't frame, excuse me, that single printed frame can't be reproduced from anything in the film. Owen Caddy has done a very extensive analysis of of the face using frame-by-frame frame imagery, and there's no frame that matches that particular one upon which this image is based. Now, interestingly, when uh, Roger was getting very sick and Ron Olson was taking the reins of uh, the Northwest Research Association, he changed the name to the North American Wildlife Association, uh, they uh, popularized this artist's redrawing of the Patterson film. And it's kind of interesting when you look at the way they show the lower face. Nostrils facing straight forward and the, the mouth kind of obscured by hair on the face here. Okay, here's a close-up. This is the final result of at least a preliminary effort by Owen Caddy to illustrate what he sees through many successive frames. And it turns out it's not really easy because it was so hot on that sandbar. Well, not it wasn't that hot. There was enough heat off the sandbar, contrasting with the cool autumn, August, or uh, excuse me, October air, that there were convection currents apparently coming up that were causing some distortion in the imagery as recorded on the film. And so, from frame to frame, the face kind of undulates a little bit because of these. Uh, convection currents. But the main thing that Owen emphasized is that there were heavy lines in the face, that the nostrils were forward facing, not a downward human looking nose, and that the distance from the nose to the mouth was much greater than is given uh, appreciation for otherwise. Uh, you know, he's got a, a muzzle, a mouth that has a lot of uh, uh, flexion lines, creases across it. Now, you know, we may quibble about details, but it's interesting that this is quite contrary. You know, when you actually look at the film and look at the details that emerge, they're very different. I didn't stick, I should have stuck in here a picture of, uh, well, and here we can compare it. This, so here's a blow up of my, my 5x7. Uh, and you can see it's kind of going beyond, but you can see the dark spots there that he's interpreting as the nostrils. You know, and then the, this surface here that's, that's quite broad because it's catching the light. Okay, and you can see the reflection off of the cheekbone here. Some people ask me, what, you know, what, what are these holes in the face? They're not holes, they're reflection of the light off of these smooth, hairless surfaces. Okay. Um, all right. The other thing that, that he shows too, the outline of the jaw, he shows and he, and he emphasizes here as well this feature. But I've drawn some attention to this protruding, what's called a gonial angle, the, ang the uh, edge, the angle of the jaw out here that clearly flares out considerably. I think I have, yeah. Now, here's, here's an interesting correlation. This is not Gigantopithecus, but this is uh, uh, Australopithecus robustus, which, based on its dentition, was this big chewing machine like Gigantopithecus was. Hyper uh, molarization of the molars and premolars, and diminutive canines that wore end to end that were lined up with the small incisors across the front, and a very deep face relative to its uh, its uh, the remainder of its skull. But what's stunning is when you put this together and you line it up 
I mean, point for point, chin, mouth, gonial angle, nasal aperture, zygomatic bone, orbits, brow ridge, you know, peak up here. The proportions are remarkable. This animal had a chewing adaptation, and I'm not saying that Patty's an australopithecine, but she had a chewing adaptation that was converged upon by both robust australopithecines as well as Gigantopithecus, based on what we do know of its jaws and teeth. Uh, these massive masses, you can see the shadow right here, this shadow, the dark area, is the shadow of the masseter, the muscle that fills this huge area here. Um, so, heavy chewing apparatus. Okay. I was going to say something else, I can't remember. And I was gratified too. Uh, Bill Munz had already stumbled kind of on this same sort of parallel. Here's one of his reconstructions of the robust australopithecines. And he had lined it up with another profile view of Patty and shown also that the facial proportions are remarkably converging. All right, and finally, what about the stature? Well, there was one other thing, one other second, there was one other thing about the face that I wanted to, that I wanted to mention. Oh, well, that was right, because it was suggested that Patty has a hairy face, and that no other eyewitnesses have described a hairy face. Well, I have to offer as an alternate uh, uh, observation that in my, um, let's see, how long? My 13 years, of not full time, but, but rather preoccupied years of, of studying this, that I have interviewed witnesses that do describe a hairy face. One of the most credible eyewitnesses that I have uh, spoken to, uh, Julie Davis, whose story was recounted in the Denver Post by Theo Stein, uh, had a very close encounter. Uh, in South, uh, Southern Colorado. She was probably only 10 feet away from an uh, eight-foot Sasquatch that was standing outside her tent. She emerged and turned around to look at it. And they locked eyes, and it was in broad daylight in the uh, early afternoon, locked eyes uh, for probably 20, 30 seconds, which I'm sure felt like an eternity to her, before it turned and walked away and um, she described its face, and she described short hair right up across the breed's nose. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of strange. It just sounds awful lot like a Wookiee or a Ewok or something. But then I reached up and I pulled down a, uh, a, uh, a book that had close-up photos of chimps and gorillas and orangutans. And despite the very hairless face of the chimpanzees, and to a lesser degree the gorillas, the orangutans had hair follicles with short hair right up across the bridge of the nose, right up underneath the eyes, up to the backs under the eyes. Um, they were short hairs, but they were present and thick. So, uh, and in this instance too, when the Sasquatch walked away as it walked towards the tree line, it turned and looked back at her and it cocked its head and whistled before it disappeared into the trees. So, well, I find I mean, there are multiple witnesses in which the subject was turned and looked back upon retreating in a fashion very similar to what Patty did. Okay, finally, this is the icing on the cake, really, is stature. So, very quickly, Grover struggled with this because using this image, and this is actually a slide from Grover's files that I inherited upon his passing. He used this length of the foot, assuming that it was about 14 and a half inches. And he said he could only fit, no matter what he tried, he could always fit about, or less than, five uh, lengths of the foot. And so he kept coming up with a, a height that was somewhere between six and six and a half feet, but no higher than that, no taller than that. Well, the problem is, this is a lousy frame to choose. He chose it because the foot is almost, appears almost perpendicular, so there would be no foreshortening of the foot. It would be a, a true uh, length that's projected parallel to the film frame. But the problem is it's way overexposed. You can't see any of the detail of the toes, and so the margins are probably way off on this. Uh, plus in this frame, the foot, the uh, individual is quite hunched. Now there's some other frames you could choose from. Now although the, the, the precision is probably going to drop off a little bit, but these are some of the frames at the very end of the film when the, the subject is moving away from, uh, 
from uh, Roger and disappearing, just about to disappear around another big crow's nest. If you take one of these and approximate a lane, you can easily get, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, at least five in there fairly comfortably. But all this really is moot because there's much more precise ways to get at this. And one of these was accomplished to the, with, certain, with a certain degree of success by Jeff Whitman um, when he was leading NASI. And he took a, a picture, whoop, that's all right. He took a, a picture that had been taken, he, he uh, utilized a picture that had been taken by Peter Byrne of Al Hodgson's son standing at the site with a, with a measuring stick. Al Hodgson's son stands six foot two inches tall. And with that frame, he was able to superimpose objects in the foreground and background, and to his satisfaction, line them up pretty well. And then superimposed additional frames with Patty in the picture. And clearly, she's much taller than six foot two. And in fact, he came up with a length, a height of another seven foot, uh, what was it, seven foot three and three quarters inches, is what it was. But also impressive is, is the girth, the mass of this being compared to this, this six foot two young man. Um, and very quickly, what he did is, using photogrammetric techniques and, and modern computer software, he mapped the uh, two-dimensional landmarks from individual film frames, and then allowed the computer to take those, uh, calculate their relationships, how they were varying with slightly different perspectives, and from that generate a three-dimensional model. But there's certain assumptions that have to be uh, programmed in, such as the focal length of the lens, the distances roughly, between the, uh, some of the subjects. He utilized for those distances the measurements that were taken by uh, uh, John Green and um, Bob Tibbetts individually at the site. Uh, what he found was though is the model kept falling short of, uh, of a satisfactory resolution, especially out of the edges. It just wasn't quite working out. Now, and this kind of leads, this segues into one of the other comments that we made earlier this afternoon. If you've ever been to the side, you find that it's a pretty narrow little spot. The, the whole uh, creek bed itself isn't much wider than, than this, uh, this auditorium. The creek kind of wanders through it. And then from, from that point, the sides of the valley are extremely steep. And in places, they are precipitous. Uh, in fact, that was one of the ways that, Rod, or that Bob knew roughly where he was at because he had a very distinct recollection of riding his horse across the creek and past a very steep cliff that was vertical. Um, when you see the film, especially when you do see the whole panorama, as has been suggested, and not just the zoomed in, cropped, and blocked uh, images and frames, you, you have a sense of a much wider open space. Now, you get some, some sense of this. Uh, of these relationships if you look at uh, Meet the Sasquatch. Chris Murphy has done some great work recreating dioramas to try to depict the three-dimensional space. But, uh, but Patty is somewhat constrained. Her course of retreat is either head for the trees, which seems to be the logical, but then what happens? You're not in the forest, you're on, on a mountainside that goes up almost vertically. So you're going to be completely exposed to view for quite some time until you get deeper into the timber. But you can go upstream, go through this little, around, around this uh, crow's nest and through this choke point in the canyon, and then the walls break down. And from there, she took a path of least resistance of a much more gentle grade uh, that took her right up the mountainside and out of the canyon. So uh, her behavior wasn't that unnatural, I don't think. If, having been at the site and seen what her choices were, she had no way of knowing what was behind Roger and Bob, so she would naturally retreat away from them upstream and going up the canyon rather than trying to navigate straight up the walls immediately. And there's a third uh, variable that, that hasn't been mentioned. When her tracks were first seen a month earlier on the Blue Mountain Blue Creek Mountain and Onion Mountain roads, when Al Hodgson called John Green and Renee Hinton to come down and investigate, and once they had left, he called Roger to let him know 
there were three sets of tracks. And Roger and Bob talk about this. They thought this was probably the middle-sized one. I mean, since it was a female, there were three. They thought maybe there was a bigger male. In reality, what they were looking at was the, the larger of the three tracks. There were 15 inch, 13 inch, and 11 inch. But, but they were aware of that. Now, where were those other two, those potential juveniles? Were they with her somewhere? No one has ever seen their footprints. No one had ever seen their footprints on the, the, the sandbar. Uh, uh, Bob Titmus looked specifically for that and, and didn't find any sign of them being nearby. But maybe they were up on the ridge. And so the last thing she wants to do is to lead these two intruders directly back to her juveniles. She would lead them some other direction, away from those perhaps. Just a thought. Now the point is, who's to say what's natural and unnatural behavior? Okay. So how many anomalies have I knocked down so far? Two, three? Well, anyway, aerospace, looking back, unnatural behavior, female. Female. There have been lots of reports of female. In the Blue Mountains, we've, we've gotten lots of eyewitness accounts describing the presence of breasts and, and in, uh, females carrying infants on their hips or on the back. Uh, so uh, all of those things, I think, are not, uh, not cause for concern. Uh, the timeline still has some vexing details that are uh, uh, troublesome. Uh, I would contest the allegation that Palo Alto was the only place that the film could be developed. Others have looked into that question and identified uh, a number of other places where DAP could have had the film uh, uh, processed. In fact, one of the ex possible explanations for his reluctance to tell why is because he may have been doing it after hours at a company uh, that, where he didn't uh, have the approval to use their equipment or have someone else use their equipment and didn't want to get someone in trouble. Uh, and it wasn't posted by the mail, it was almost certainly sent by via um, uh, air post, air carrier from the Eureka uh, Arcata Airport, not the post office. The airport's open all online long. Uh, 